Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Sims. I'm with Natural Resources Defense Council, and I'm really happy to be here this morning with an exciting panel about climate justice. Um, so the, what we're going to do is we're going to be talking to three illustrious leaders, which I'll introduce in a moment. Um, for We'll run through um, a quick discussion that I'll give about the overall topic and the some updates on the federal, um, what's called the Clean Energy Accelerator Program. Then we'll have questions from each of our panelists, to each of our panelists. And at the end, we'll have questions from the audience. So please feel free to use the chat um, for any questions or the, or the Q or comments in the Q&A. Um, I'll be monitoring both of them. So let's just get started. So um, thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks to the SOCAP team for putting this uh, panel together. So our general topic is how do we finance climate justice um, in this really important um, and difficult era of opportunity and also crisis. So what we have here is three illustrious guests. We have Kerry O'Neill, um, who's CEO of Inclusive Prosperity Capital, and also was recently named the Environmental Financial Advisory Board of US EPA. Bravo, Kerry. We have Kathy Mann, the CEO and President of Inclusive, a network um, of CDFI credit unions, or well, CDCUs, excuse me, um, and also um, itself a CDFI. And we have Omar Blayton, who's CFO at SunWealth. Uh, the bios of the speakers are actually in, are in the chat, so if you want to get more details, please um, and go there. I won't go into any of their illustrious backgrounds, but I mean, you can get them there. So general topic, um, intermediaries of various kinds are key to delivering on climate justice. And climate justice and intermediaries come in different formats. They can be public, like green banks or development banks. They can be um, nonprofits, like inclusive prosperity capital, nonprofit, um, private nonprofit. They can be cooperatives. And like credit unions, they can be private for-profit companies like SunWealth. All these are critical for moving the commitments of the finance to realities on the ground in communities. All seek to scale through creating innovative and tailored products and platforms and developing project pipelines. And critically, all need a supply of the right kind of capital. We need to blend different kinds of capital concessional, non-concessional capital. And more importantly, you need credibility on the ground in communities. You cannot access climate justice from top down. It must be bottom up. You need aligned developers to bring projects. You need a clear understanding of what communities, um, of the communities are trying to serve. So as background for this discussion, there's two sort of key things that are happening right now. One is the Justice 40. Um, initiative, which is a whole of government approach that Biden administration have launched to work with states and communities to make good on Biden's promise to deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in clean energy and climate to disadvantaged communities. This is a critical commitment, but again, it's a commitment. It's not implementation. So one key possible tool to um, provide the kind of capital and expertise that will be needed to really um, drive this commitment at scale um, and in a time frame which we which we, which we which is consistent with the need for climate and for communities it is something that's called clean energy and sustainability accelerator. This is a proposal that I've been involved with for a very long time in NRDC for essentially a federal green bank, which would provide long-term low-cost capital both to um, these green banks, which are specialized intermediaries designed for, for, for climate and clean energy, but also the community of community development, financial institutions, MDIs, and other mission-driven um, lenders and investors. So this is a really exciting proposal. It's actually, I just checked it on it last night. It's actually right now in reconciliation still at the $20 billion level. And in, of that 20 billion, 40% um, or 8 billion is required to go to disadvantaged communities. So it would be a huge um, insertion of capital into the market. 
Um, what we're hearing that also is that it's not a program which we expect um, senators who are um, dragging their feet on climate to resist because it actually creates a lot of jobs and opportunities all around the country. And is, and is also, it's a great mix of public-private partnership. So we think that the senators um, of all kinds will be behind this proposal and to survive this process should it be successful. Uh, just a couple details on it. The House has passed this legislation three times in the past 16 months. The general um, concept is that the, uh, the federal government will deposit funds in an independent nonprofit called the Accelerator. Um, the president endorsed the concept um, himself early in his administration of $27 billion level. It's been scaled back a little bit. Over the past few months, um, with the reconciliation, there's been some changes to the program to, to fit reconciliation. And so the program, instead of being creating a new nonprofit, it must be created through existing programs. So the existing program that, that's being used under the current legislation is called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. And that fund would allow um, the EPA to make grants um, to fund nonprofits to fulfill this role. Um, there's also a, a separate $7 billion fund for LMI Solar, separate from the, from the accelerator program. What's really exciting about this program is that this money can flow um, long-term, long low-cost capital, both to the network of existing green banks around the country, which is growing, and also directly to CDFIs and other community lenders. So very exciting. So this is an important topic as background for this discussion because one thing we know is that without having the right kind of capital, we won't be able to deliver climate justice to communities. So I'm going to, um, I should say one more thing about this. It's really a critical element of President Biden's um, Justice 40 commitment. It's hard to see how he's going to be able to get this through about something like this um, that really catalyzes the market in a, in a profound and comprehensive way. It's also a big part of delivering on Paris Agreement commitments. So we're going to turn to the intermediaries now for, for some uh, Q&A about their different perspectives on the market and the accelerator opportunity. So I'm going to start with a question for all of you. Um, so we'll go through what, why, and how in our question. So this is the first, this is what question. So um, for each of you, a private nonprofit green bank like Harry, um, who's also worked at Connecticut Green Bank, a credit union, and a private um, impact focused solar development and financing firm, what role do you seek to play in the market to advance climate and equity? What opportunities do you see? What challenges do you face? Let's start with Carrie on this first question. Great. Thanks, okay. Doug. And thanks, SOCAP. Um, great to be here um, in conversation on this great topic. So the role that Inclusive Prosperity Capital plays, is, as Doug said, we're a not-for-profit um, private intermediary. Uh, think of us as a boundaryless green bank. We actually spun out of the Connecticut Green Bank, and we work at the intersection of community development and clean energy finance and climate impact. And we work through partners on the ground who need the kind of financing solutions that we can bring to the table that are made possible by mission aligned investors who are investing in us and want to drive capital into these communities. So we really are, are looking to take the, some of the innovations that we did at the Connecticut Green Bank and learning from others and bring scaled solutions into the communities that, that need it most, as, as you've been talking about, Doug. You know, those that have traditionally been um, left behind and not a focus of clean energy and clean energy finance. So in terms of opportunities, as, as we spun out of Connecticut and our roots in, in New England, we have just been struck by how there is demand everywhere from communities all across the country who have not traditionally been part of the clean energy you know, revolution and transition. They want climate solutions. They want resilience. They, um, and, and we see an opportunity to standardized approaches to better serve these communities. 
which kind of speaks to the challenges. These these are communities that are that before the pandemic were stretched before the recent you know economic upheaval, and and Kathy can speak you know so eloquently to this. So I'll I'll let you speak to it even more. But but we need to recognize that that it's challenging to serve these communities. Um, they have a lot of needs, not just climate needs. And so how do we help them and um, and bring these solutions to bear? Um, and, and then from our intermediary perspective, another challenge that we see um, is getting the right cost of capital at scale so that the accelerator would be amazing if it gets passed. That would be transformative, we think. Um, and another challenge for us is just the investment in product development that needs to happen um, to address these markets. Let's go to Kathy then, Omar. Great, thanks. Uh, hi. Um, so, so uh, inclusive has a forty-plus-year history focusing on financial inclusion and equity through our network of community development credit unions. And just a real quick, uh, you know, community development credit unions are financial cooperatives, and they're community development because they have a primary mission of community development and are generally organized sort of by, for, and of low-income people and communities that have historically lacked access to capital. So we kind of come at it from kind of a, a slightly different vantage point as I, from IPC, but, but met in the middle, so to speak. Because in recent years, as our members have been increasingly experiencing in their communities the impacts, the negative impacts of, of climate events, there's been a real interest in a, a real growing interest in sort of designing initially sort of resiliency solutions and now kind of really leaning into like, how do we use our capital as a community and a community institution to be driving solutions around clean energy, around climate action? And so, you know, in, in that way, we've sort of come from the, you know, the equity, the, you know, space and move towards you know, this is a critical defining, you know, set of challenges for our communities. And it's something that our credit unions really want to understand better and be able to use their capital to address the challenge, the challenges. And as, you know, and Carrie touches, touches on them so well, you know, there are a lot of challenges and opportunities when you're thinking about that intersection between, you know, between racial equity, between financial inclusion and climate action. Um, you wanna think about, you know, when you're thinking about the types of products that you wanna design, you really need to think about kind of the existing way in which borrowers in those communities can, can manage debt and manage credit, right? So you have to think about the structuring of the terms around, you know, uh, clean energy um, financing tools really need to be adapted to what the needs of the community is and the needs of the members are, the needs of the, the residents. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, really trying to figure out like with the community, with the membership, with the, um, the target market, how do we think about structuring these loan products so that people can, for example, be able to purchase electric vehicles so that people can be able to, you know, look at doing energy efficiency up, up retrofits on their homes. They can be thinking about solar on their homes. They can be thinking about different ways that they could be investing in um, energy efficiency and for, for their, their homes, their businesses, you know, and in their communities. And a lot of that is really thinking about how you structure the term. So I know we'll get into a lot of that, but, you know, it's going to be longer terms. It's going to be a heavy focus on energy burden and understanding the current energy burden and helping people really think about kind of the way in which this could be a solution for their own pocketbook, as well as for, um, you know, as well as sort of good for the community and good uh, for the globe. Um, there's a lot of sort of a culture shift that's starting to happen that needs to be accelerated around, you know, I, it, it's very easy to see solar or energy efficiency or clean energy, green products as kind of a luxury item, a boutique product, so to speak. So even our members who have, you know, early adopters of 
clean and green products, they found that it was their higher income members that were taking advantage of that. And so I think really matching it up to like what the solutions are for individuals. And that's where CDFIs really come in because we kind of know how to tweak and, you know, manage and re revamp products to be as useful as pop possible for the population. And I'll just say, it's never going to be one product because every everybody comes in with different sets of needs. And so you really need to be thinking in terms of suites of products, you know, a, a whole range of interventions that a household, a business, or a, you know, a local organization might be needing to use. So I'll turn it back to you, Doug. Thanks, Brian. Kathy. Omar. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, so um, SunWealth is, you know, purely a, a for-profit entity, uh, but a, a mission-driven one. And so very similar to uh, Carrie and Kathy, I think, uh, you know, what we look to do is catalyze investments in areas that have been traditionally overlooked by uh, large institutions and capital. And, you know, the, the way that we do that, however, is, you know, we're really trying to shine a light on the perceived risk in these areas um, and, you know, kind of bring into your proper alignment kind of the risk adjusted returns that we're really talking about. So, you know, we focus on the solar market and we focus on the small commercial scale. So we uh, we put products on small businesses, um, not-for-profits, as well as uh, in communities with low and moderate income residents. All these places have plenty of credit worthy customers, but they're just not credit rated. And so in order to really you know, drive investment in that area, we, we have to kind of up in the, the traditional proxies and things that are used in order to you know, deploy you know, large capital from, from the major banks. And so you know, we have done about 500 projects so far to date almost. And you know, still kind of fundamentally underwriting at a local level, partnering with local developers in order to kind of proliferate and democratize the benefits that solar can provide, you know, at the community level. That's really exciting. Great, great first round of who you are and what you're doing. Let's pivot over to we're with the investment community today, and I think a lot of a lot of folks here. We're looking at um, both both uh, financial returns and social and environmental returns. So let's talk about what kind of returns you're generating um, in terms of social and environmental returns. And why are these communities the right place for um, mission-driven investors to focus on, to invest through your platforms? What are the impacts you're tracking or seeking, or seeking to impact with your work? That would be of interest to investors um, trying to generate impact and returns, potential returns. Let's start with let's start with Omar this time. Sure. So on the impact level, um, obviously we, we track you know carbon reduction as well as uh, job years and job creation. Uh, we want to make sure that you know we're creating local jobs through our projects, and then of course um, savings to our customers, our off takers. So, you know, the economic benefits and how they're being spread um, to the customers and then as well as to the local developers. Uh, on the investment side, we're, we're tracking, you know, the rate of return. Um, you know, we're proud of the fact that we feel we don't uh, necessarily need cons uh, concessionary capital, uh, but, you know, we're, you know, market, obviously market rate capital given the, the proper risk assessment, not not the perceived market rate capital. Um, and, and as well as uh, our payments. So, you know, we've been around since 2014. We've had zero defaults on our payments and met all of our targeted returns, all of our investors. And, you know, we're, we're proving out a track record. Like I said before, we have a number of projects at this point and a number of uh, fund vintages that you know, are coming to maturity. So we hope to kind of keep proving this out to, to go forward. But that's that's what we present. Thanks, Omar. Kathy, what's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, you know, I, I love how all this complements each other. You know, in terms of impacts, I think our starting point is really around, you know, vulnerability and around energy burden. Um, you know, when our... We, our movement kind of got started shifting into um, climate action, 
you know, as a result of, of, of natural disasters. And, you know, our, we have a large uh, membership segment from Puerto Rico and, um, and that really brought inclusive into the space is starting, you know, immediately following hurricane Maria, when the grid in Puerto Rico went down, you know, there was an immediate recognition that there needed to be rebuilding with resiliency. And that included solar and that included solar on our branches, right? So the network of credit unions needed to have, they need to be up and running the, you know, the within 48 hours of hurricane Maria hitting every single cooperativa on the Island of Puerto Rico was up and running. They were handing out cash to keep people basically, you know, being able to meet basic, you know, basic needs. And they were doing that without power. And now, you know, there was an immediate pivot to say, we need to at least have solar operation, you know, solar capability so that we can be managing our branch operations and serving our community as we, you know, as we go through these kinds of events. Um, and then it kind of grew from there that we want to make sure that that our, you know, our members are rebuilding their homes and their structures with, you know, as energy efficiently as possible and with solar capability, right? And, you know, same is true with our members now in Southeast uh, Louisiana and along the Gulf Coast, right? Because as those areas are increasingly targeted, there's a recognition that we have to be kind of focusing in on that vulnerability focus. That's our starting point. Um, and then really, and, and tracking that, are we getting, are we doing better during some of these, you know, hardest uh, climate events in being able to make sure that service remains, that people are able to get access to their, to their cash and able to get access to small loans and be able to keep their basic needs of their households going. Um, and then from there, how do we help people to really think about reducing, looking at, understanding, analyzing some of that energy burden that they're carrying and really understanding that as part of a broader conversation around financial counseling and coaching in which we really help them think about this is also a budget impact. So how do we kind of track the ability for people to be able to be better off in their household budgets as a result? So that's sort of the space that we're moving in in the in the climate impact, and then hoping that the additional impact benefits can be tracked as we go. Um, and then on, you know, financial returns, these are actually, you know, um, a CDFIs who are always taking risk and always sort of pushing the envelope and trying to dig deeper in our markets and dig deeper in our communities to make sure we're reaching people who need it. These are actually really good these are good loans. And I know T Carrie can talk a lot more about that in terms of the data that she's been able to amass, but these are solid and, you know, these are loans that repay very, very well. These are loans in which people actually can benefit from syncing up the energy reduction and be able to sync up their repayments to that. So not only are they good returns for the financial institution, but they're really good returns on the household budget. Yeah, so I'll I'll just say you know yes to all of what Omar and Kathy are say, saying saying um, coming out of the Connecticut Green Bank and and at IPC we are data hounds and we do a tremendous amount of tracking, but maybe stepping back into that broader like the why of what we're tracking, um, you know the these are communities that are having outsized disparate impacts from climate change. EPA in September put out a really, really terrific report um, that I'll, I'll drop a, a link into the chat in a moment about on, you know, the, the outsized impacts, you know, climate change will impact everybody, but it's going to have greater impact on a set of communities that are low income, that are frontline, that have had, um, you know, you know, suffered through environmental um, degradation due to where we're placing our power systems and, and what have you. And so, so a part of the tracking too is thinking about what, where are there, you know, ancillary benefits around health outcomes like asthma because of indoor and outdoor, um, you know, air quality issues. Um, and where, of course, you know, jobs is a big one and the economic development and the energy burden reduction, the ability to, you know, change the dynamic of your pop pocketbook or your church's pocketbook or your social services pocketbook or your municipality's pocketbook, what have you. That's a piece of it, too. Um, but I think um, we all have an opportunity to think about the why and the where, you know, so where we're focused and why we're focused are connected. Um, and the financial system has a history, a pretty rotten history, right, of 
redlining and um, racial disparities. And so, you know, as we're engaged in the financing realm, the opportunity to, you know, create solutions that can become part of changing that dynamic on the record, you know, the restorative and reparative nature of things is, is another thing that we can track through lots and lots of different ways um, that, you know, uh, Omar and Kathy talked about. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Omar. Thanks, Carrie. Great um, understanding of the impacts. I'm going to move to some specific questions for, for you guys now. Um, I'm going to start with um, with Kathy uh, again, since we're thinking thinking about the accelerator, talking to impact investors. Um, we know we need to have a landing cost of capital that works um, for the borrower, for the member. In your case, what when you think about the capital stack in this space? What is the ideal capital stack um, from your perspective for these kinds of these kinds of loans? Yeah, and I think it's a you know a great question for um, you know for a panel with, you know at an investor conference because I think one of the most important things for impact investors to be thinking about is you know you kind of are always sort of trying to figure out your own like risk return kind of calculations and one of the things I think when you see the growth of CDFI lending in the climate justice space, it, it gives you a lot of options around kind of that, the, the capital stack and where you want to be with your own investing and lending in that, in that space. So, you know, as community development credit union, so we're the network, a network of community development credit unions. We're also at inclusive, a, a CDFI intermediary. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll sort of build a capital stack with a number of different diverse investors who have different levels of risk tolerance and different needs for returns. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, the, the sort of equity capital, which is certainly something we will hope to see from the accelerator, you know, the ability of the accelerator to deliver just sort of that basic equity investment into on the ground community lenders is going to be really critical. That equity comes in. And in the case of, you know, community development uh, depository institutions like community development banks and credit unions, that equity comes in. And from that, you can sort of, the institutions can take that, what we tend to call in the credit union space, sort of that primary capital. You can take that and leverage some secondary capital, which is usually a subordinated loan. It's a little bit higher risk loan with a bit, you know, with a significant return and sort of, you can then take, you know, use that to sort of bring in, you have got, got a nice primary capital cushion to be in first position before a secondary capital investor who's willing to take some risk if there's significant losses and is going to get a return to justify that. And then as depository institutions, with that kind of combination of primary and secondary capital, you can go out and raise deposits, whether it's from your community and your membership, or whether it's, you know, in the investor space with non-member deposits, you can raise up to $10 of deposits for every $1 you're bringing in, in primary or secondary capital. And so we think a lot about kind of what that appropriate capital stack is. Deposits are, you know, for somebody who's new to the space and they're just testing the waters and they're not quite sure, you know, whether this is the right space, a non-member deposit is a perfect instrument because it's up to $250,000, it's fully insured by the federal government, just like, you know, FDIC insurance for credit unions, it's called National Credit Union Chair Insurance Fund, but it's federally insured um, funds. So you can kind of figure out where you're going to be. And we actually at Inclusive manage a deposit platform, a social impact deposit platform. So we can work with sort of large investors that come in with, say, a $10 million deposit, you know, it, where they want to break it up into deposits. And we can, through our platform, have that sort of shaved down to about 40, $250,000 deposits each. So it's all completely insured going out to multiple different institutions. So, you know, that's kind of an easy way for investors to get started. It's deposits though, you know, so just look at what your bank's return is. It's pretty low. You're not going to get a significant return on that, but you know that money is safe and it fits, you know, comes from an endowment or an area or something that you're not able to risk. 
that's something you can, you know, get started with. And then you kind of see how those kind of overall that kind of reporting works and how that lending goes. And you can get a little bit more flavor for kind of going sort of deeper down into the capital stack. So, you know, this combination of like for our, for us, the beauty of an accelerator is it's that kind of initial catalyzing seed investment. There's other ways to do it too. We have a number of investors who've done things like credit enhancements that bring in other type of um, slightly risk funds that enable us to continue to build up that capital stack. But there's a lot of great opportunities to be making investments in this area that are really going to reverberate and leverage a tremendous amount of capital on the ground. Thank you, Kathy. So Omar, this is a bit of a trick question because we've done a talk before so um you mentioned a little bit earlier about um how sun wealth is focused on perceived risk so how does sun wealth generate returns by investing in the riskiest part of this of the, of the commercial solar market yeah thanks Doug. Uh, um so i mean to, to start it's our general approach to the investment you know, while kind of impact is core to our DNA, I mean, we're not just B Corp certified, we're a B Corp by the charter, that's with the state of Delaware, our corporate charter is a B Corp. Um, the capital we seek isn't necessarily always mission aligned. We have a lot of mission aligned investors and we love them, they're fantastic, but um, some aren't. And so, you know, them being the lowest common denominators, how do we, how do we appeal to them? And there we have to prove that this is a market where, I mean, there's almost an arbitrage opportunity. Where you know there's a perceived risk, but that risk is way lower than you know what you're actually what you're actually taking on. And so the way we do that versus is through fundamental underwriting, where a lot of institutions, because they have to put so much capital work at one time, and we're dealing with like small localized projects, they're going to use proxies. Well, proxies aren't necessarily the best version. Using a proxy that you use for certain types of projects aren't going to apply to the projects in a market that you haven't tapped before. And so you really have to kind of be you know, local and very granular about how you look at how these different entities and people fit into these communities and you know, whether their, their, their assessed risk is the same as what the perceived risk is, which again, it usually is not. The second part is using historical data. Like I said, we have almost 500 projects under now, which have been operational from between you know, six months to the last you know, six years or so. And you know, we're able to really tease out what have been the drivers between any kind of hiccups. We haven't had any real defaults, but you know, delays in payment or things like that. And that allows us to be you know creative in our structuring and innovative in kind of looking at you know not just the person paying for the power, but what you know state incentives are involved or what ways you can uh, take get site control in order to come up with uh, creative default options in the case of. Uh, if there is a default. And so, you know, the recovery, you might have a default, but the recovery is going to be three quarters or 80%. And that's going to be state back in some cases. So that's another way to look at it. And then finally, and this is the most important piece, is, you know, we have um, flexible and opportunistic capital. Like I said, it's not always mission aligned, but it always has to be flexible. You can't put these traditional constraints, particularly around closing costs or, um, you know, you can't apply the same kind of underwriting criteria to kind of a small commercial deal that's, you know, 50, 150 kilowatts that you do to a yard utility scale deal, which is like 10 megawatts, where you might have 85 advisors looking at a deal. And sure, it's only going to be, you know, it might be, you know, $100,000, but, you know, on a 10, $20 million deal, so what? On a, you know, $150,000 deal, it doesn't happen. So you have to, you know, you have to have capital that's willing to kind of Look at what we've done so far and what we have proven out and say, hey, this and, and think about it and just really kind of, you know, be contemplative about you know, what risk are we really taking on? And once we were able to kind of do that, we're able to convince a lot of people that this is a good deal. And especially you know, once they've invested, they tend to reinvest because, again, we keep making our payments on time. So they're they're happy about that. So that's um now, you know, the trick question part is it's not the riskiest part of the stack, but you know, how do we show that it's not the riskiest? And, and that's how, how we do it. Thanks for that detail, Omar. That's great. So we're going to do uh, one more for, for Carrie, and then we're going to sort of mix in some audience questions, some other questions in the last 10 minutes. 
So, Kerry, um, I know before, I know you you were at the, the Green Bank and now you're at IPC, um, and just want to explore. Um, you've seen sort of the life cycle of some of these companies that have that have been involved in this space for a while. And can you can you talk about how um, in this space, as a, as one of these mission driven lenders, Green Banks, you've seen um, companies um, scale business models serving these communities and, and demonstrating the su- success at different stages of their development. Yeah, yeah. The, a softball. You you let me talk about my favorite success story, uh, which is our partnership in Connecticut with Posigen, uh, which is um, uh, it's a for profit but mission oriented company that offers a lease for solar as well as an energy efficiency package. It's targeted at low to moderate income homeowners. And the company got started as part of the post-Katrina rebuild down in Louisiana. And as we were looking around in Connecticut, figuring out, like, how do we get more solar into low income communities? We have we had done a lot of analysis. We had a lot of low income homeowners in Connecticut, which, which was like you know, a surprise to us. We didn't understand that until we looked at the data. And so we looked to attract in Posigen into the state to really allow us to focus in on this market that was so dramatically underserved. So the rate of solar penetration back in 2014 in the low and moderate income census tracts was like 10 times lower than in affluent census tracts. And in Connecticut, income and race correlate. So that also meant, you know, communities of color like one-to-one overlap. Um, And then we brought in Posigen. We attracted them in um, through an open RFP process where we said, tell us what you need, um, all you solar financiers out there focused in residential. And Posigen came in um, with a proposal that um, said, hey, we want to co-brand with you because your credibility as a quasi-public in these communities, government agencies, really important because you know what? This, you know, go solar for mo- no money down sounds too good to be true. And that's like a huge barrier. Uh, so that trust is a big issue. Um, and by the way, to come into a new market and to focus on, on this market, as Omar talked about, the perceived risk is a huge issue. So their capital providers, for them to scale up, it was going to be inordinately expensive for them to bring in the capital to come into Connecticut. So Connecticut Green Bank stepped into the position of being you know, the subordinate debt piece in a broader capital stack that attracted other Connecticut and other you know, outside Connecticut investors to create the initial fund that allowed Posigen to come into the market. And then we, you know, co-branded together municipal-based campaigns. They um, they went, they opened their um, offices in Bridgeport, you know, a very poor city, one of the poorest cities in America. Um, and to this day, I think Bridgeport, at, you know, across Connecticut probably has the largest number, like sheer number of solar installs in low income census tracts, which is just phenomenal. And so we did community based campaigns together, um, you know, leveraging, uh, you know, youth sports leagues and schools and houses of worship and city council members and you know all the things that we know work when you need a trusted messenger. Um, and they hired from within the community, which was also phenomenal. So bringing jobs in. And we were able to turn around that dynamic in, I think it took us three years to change the dynamic in terms of the rate of penetration. So Connecticut is now a beyond parity state in terms of having on a pro rata basis, more solar in low income and communities of color um, than in white and affluent communities on a pro rata basis. Um, that. That doesn't solve all the problems. That's not helping home uh, renters. Um, but but in that little market, it showed how you can use blended capital stack and intermediator intermediary strategies to partner with private companies whose business model is to go where nobody else goes. Like Omar's business model is to go where nobody else goes. Um, you know, the next round of this is Block Power. Uh, Block Power is doing this with, um, you know, heat pumps and other clean energy in the urban core. Um, you know, similarly mispriced risk from the capital provider side of things. And, and IPC was, you know, the first credit provider to Block Power as they stood up a heat pump leasing product. 
product. And behind that came other capital that said, oh, wait, okay, now I see there's an opportunity here. So, it, the, you know, intermediaries like all of us play a really critical role to help these companies who are trying to be part of the solution get going. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. So I think it looks like the, the questions in the side have been addressed. So I'm going to, there's a question about um, grants. I think, Carrie, you addressed that. Um, this question about preserving um, and creating new affordable housing. Does someone want to address the, the affordable housing uh, question? Yeah, I, I did briefly in the chat. Um, so Seth, totally yeah, okay. agree. Yeah, that that affordable housing and climate justice are, you know, that this goes to, you know, the redlining issue. This goes to where the disparate impacts are. Um, I will just say, though, it, it is complex. The capital stacks are complex. The, the variety of, of building types is complex. So the solutions you need for affordable housing for two to four units and five to nine units is very different than like your 50 plus unit buildings. Um, and so and the capital stacks are different and the the owner uh, profiles and, and their own capacity is different. And so it's it's a complex space, one in which we all have so much work to do. It is an opportunity to do a lot more work on the standardization and productization side of things. Um, and that somebody asked where um, where philanthropy can help, you know, philanthropy helping to fund the product development because this we're, we're all small organizations. This is hard work to do the product development, um, but also that early catalytic capital to test out strategies where, you know, cause we're not always going to get it right the first time. We, we know that from Connecticut Green Bank. We, I launched in my team 11 products in five years and like we had three bombs, you know, that, so, and we learned from that. And then the next time around, you know, you do better. So, That's super helpful. So we got about, I think, three minutes left, if, if I have this correct. So um, let's do, if you can squeeze in a lightning round. Um, well, I'm going to do it a little bit different. I think we kind of covered some of the some of the questions about hurdle rate and proxy. So let's go to the question about technology. Um, how important are digital platforms or fintech generally to your businesses? financial inclusion and climate justice. And what opportunities does digitization of decision-making and finance um, hold for, for investors? Let's do a lightning round. Keep your comments to about 45 seconds. Let's start with Kathy. Okay. Um, just uh, overarching, uh, you know, scaling requires sort of a movement toward technology and platforms and digitization. Um, just across the board in all community development lending, we have a really critical moment happening right now where the more that, you know, institutions are automating, if we don't have automated solutions and algorithms that understand a low income consumer and marketplace, we're going to be shifting our institutions away from our market. So it's critical that that investment is not in sort of off the shelf solutions it requires additional investment because we have to be building it from the algorithms and designing our own algorithms based on the history of community development lending. So real quick, we were, we're super excited about a partnership we're doing with, um, with IPC in expanding their smart e loan program, which is a platform that can enable us to like build in products that are tried and true in the community development landscape and be able to have some of that, some of those automating procedures be it, and processes at least enable us to standardize for the right marketplace. Thanks, Kathy. Omar, give us a quick take. Your quick take. Yeah, no, I um, I gotta agree with with Kathy. So it's two parts of it. So it one, you know, from a, a marketing outreach, it's, it can be fantastic, but then you have to make sure that the people you're trying to to reach have adequate access to that technology or or bandwidth. To, to even see it. So it's one piece. And then the other end is using algorithms to um, kind of enhance and, you know, speed up your, your time around underwriting or, or products. Uh, but like any model, it's, it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you make the wrong assumptions or you're using insufficient data points um, and outside of the communities that you're, you're focusing on, your, your answers you're going to get on um, the recommendations are not going to be useful. 
So I think those are, you know, the two things you got to keep in mind. But, you know, on the surface, obviously technology, you can always need to improve the technology and kind of think of ways to apply that. Yeah, and I would just, to build on that, say really quickly that um, these communities that we're serving, you know, the transaction size tends to be lower and transaction costs are higher. And so um, as opposed to being focused on automating the underwriting, we're very focused on streamlining the entire process of, you know, technology enabled, um, you know, digitization of the document collection, the underwriting package and what have you, so that we can be as efficient as possible and scale because these transaction sizes are, are smaller. So there's a huge role and we've invested a lot in that. Well, I want to thank the panelists. This has been a really great session. We've got a lot done in 45 minutes. Um, Hopefully there'll be, there'll be a recording, I'm guessing. We have the contacts that were in the, either in the system here or in the LinkedIn. Uh, thanks for joining. And um, reach out if you have any, want to continue the discussion, any of the panelists or myself. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks you guys. Doug.